Just a little bit about myself, just to start. I've been with the Mass Board of Underwater Archaeological Resources, which most of you probably don't know exists, but has since 1973 uh, in state law, uh, since uh, 1987. I've been there 32 years, uh, just shy. In, in February, I'll be there 32 years, and I'll be leaving shortly thereafter. I'll be retiring. So these will no longer be free lectures. Um, <laughs> just, just saying. No. no. I'm actually trained as a, started out as a terrestrial archaeologist. Uh, I've done industrial archaeology, and ships are sort of industrial, but I've done mills and pre ancient Native American sites. I've worked everything highway surveys. Uh, so I've been in archaeology for over 40 years as a paid professional. So I've been around a long time. This is due to doing financial research for the Commonwealth <laughs> and having two children. Uh, but. Uh, I, I really enjoy this kind of work. I like coming out to talk about our resources because people really don't realize the extent of Massachusetts heritage. It's hidden because many times it's right in front of your face and there's some right here in Manchester that most people don't even see and I'll talk about that later. But it's also because so much of it's shipwrecks and underwater that it's hidden. But it's a little bit of both. Uh, I cannot dive anymore, it's a wet and cold. But with that, uh, just a quick note on this. I'd love to start with this image. I have to play with it some more. I'll give you the dates. This is the ADK Dame, and she's a schooner built in 1875 in Essex by the Burnham family. Uh, but in any event, what I like about this is you see when it wrecked, and it was stripped pretty soon after it was wrecked. And as you look at the use of the site, the change, uh, it's not so much the shipwreck that interests me itself but the way that beach changes. And if you look at, at Steep Hill, which this really needs to be relabeled, just to tell you that sometimes we kind of hide the locations a little bit. If you really look closely at these images, the, the ones from the 2000s, it's a really nice tree-covered hill. Stripped clean in 1900. It's a bald uh, drumlins and, and uh, um, sand dunes. What's kind of cool about it is the sand dunes are like 20 feet high back then, and today they're about eight, six to eight feet high. So you're seeing a change in the environment there. With that, we can move on. Most of the time when people think about underwater archaeology, maritime archaeology, nautical archaeology, I use all the different terms. They mean something very specific, but for the general public, they're all the same. Uh, you think a tragedy like this vessel that's really wrecked up here, it's supposedly the Jason in Truro. They also could be a vessel in North Carolina, a vessel in South Carolina, Florida, and California, as I've seen it in many shipwreck books depicted. The same photograph. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a tragedy, and I guess it's a kind of a mystery, like this other vessel in the foreground. This vessel, I don't know, foreground in the background on your upper right, that vessel, that picture's in backwards. Someone was doing the scanning, didn't know how to read the slides, put it in backwards, and when we went to the slide show, it's like, oh, this doesn't look quite right. And then as I looked at it, knowing the location, if you look really carefully, that Salt Island at Good Harbor Beach, and on the wrong side of Salt Island, you can see the Thatcher Island lights. This may or may not be the fishing schooner Frank L, which was pulled out in the 70s. They took it out of the beach, supposedly. I'm sure if that dune moves a little bit on the sort of the way from the concession sand towards the neighborhood to the south, it's probably still there. And everyone thinks about treasure. I want to tell you, I've never in my entire archaeological career found a coin. <laughs> <laughs> and in this one, I love to show that prominent gold coin in there. This is from the Witter site, 1717. That's the gold coin. The rest is silver. They found some gold jewelry, which is depicted in there. You can't see it very well. Uh, but that's the extent of the gold off of that treasure wreck. Lots of silver, and it is a treasure wreck. But, so, but again, I never really find that. Most of the time when people think about shipwrecks, you, your image is on the left. The, a wrecking ship. A shipwreck is really what I encounter on the wreck. That wrecking ship is a local shipwreck. It's the Vernon. And most people don't know that that wreck on Lynn Beach. You think about Lynn Beach, there's the Tedesco, people hear about that wreck a lot by Red Rocks. Mm -hmm. 
but the burning, 1802. This image, which is a really poor lithographic copy of a painting, uh, depicts a lot of people in the foreground. And a, and a vessel or a longboat going out. I, I think that was just added by the artists. I don't believe that happened. Because that'd be a hell of a ride. But those people are there, and you almost also think, great, well, they're here to help. Yes, to help themselves to anything they can help them. And for the entertainment of watching a shipwreck. And I'm very serious, but they were there to help themselves until they got caught. Uh, but they were there for the entertainment value. They came down, and this is true of many wrecks. People come, hey, today, if there's a vessel wrecking out here, I, and if I can get down there, I'd be on the beach watching too. You just, it's something different that's, it's, it, and that it might not be the right word, but it fits the situation. Uh, on your right is the remains of an unknown vessel in um, at the Cape Cod National Seashore. A different groups of archaeologists have come down and looked at this piece when it pops up. And it literally pops up. It's not like buried in the sand. It didn't. It kind of gets pushed up by the wave action, which is horrendous, really tremendous. A lot of energy, and then it's dragged offshore again. So it's not floating really. Wood kind of floats and it kind of doesn't float. It's how you kind of how do you use it? A lot of wood sinks. So when they, people are, you go in, the, in Maine, there's a big industry in Moosehead and Tobago Lake about recovering old logs. Uh, we, it's not really. Here in Massachusetts, on, it could happen, say, in the Connecticut, but no one's really thought about it. Logs sink. They get saturated with water, and they sink. They don't just float forever. But in any event, this, this, this wood um, is pushed up, but it's not floating up onto the beach. We still don't know what it is, and I get a little bit of a story later on about it. Uh, why do ships wreck? Well, you know, foul weather, navigation errors for seamanship, shall we say. Uh, in this case, I love these two images, and you'll see why. First, they illustrate what vessels are, their function. If you think about it, three-masted schooners and two-masted schooners are the vessels of transportation in the 19th century. They are the tractor trailers and the box trucks of that era. And in fact, into the 30s, vessel cargo transport in New England was still outpacing a lot of rail. Even coal was still coming up by vessel. In the case here, you've got the, um, the Hannah Schubert, about 1895-1896, and that's a three-master. Uh, what you don't see in this image, which is cut out, there's the uh, bosun's chair being shot over by the life-saving crew to bring the crew off. You can kind of catch a little bit of the line in there. Um, in the foreground is the Plymouth Rock, two-masted schooner. You can see the crew still on her. Really rough seas. You wouldn't, people aren't really going to come over that sheltered side and get out because that surf is pretty dangerous. So even though it looks like it's easy to get to, it really isn't. What's kind of neat about that picture on the right is that if you look in the foreground, you see the vessel remains in front of the Plymouth Rock. That's the Hannah Schubert. So that navigation problem along Cape Cod, this is sort of the Truro wealthy area, really treacherous. Accidents and fire. This is spontaneous combustion of a vessel, unnamed vessel in Vineyard Haven Harbor on Martha's Vineyard. Uh, it was carrying a cargo of lime from Maine. Most people don't re realize that lime and salt water don't really like to mix. Great on your lawn. In fact, when I give a school program, I talk about lime. Kids have no idea. They think of those green <laughs> fruits. And it's like, oh, you know, that white powder they put in your lawn in the spring. Dead silence. They don't, they don't have that image of what we have. That stuff, mixed with salt water, creates a tremendous amount of heat energy. And you usually get spontaneous combustion. And I'll talk about a specific example shortly. Uh, Acts of War. This is the only image, or one of the very few images, is not Massachusetts. But we did have sinkings in World War I and World War II in close proximity to our shores. Um, very close in World War I, a little bit further out in World War II because some of those records are still classified. And they have different stories for some of the sinkings, but I like to make up stories about some of the other sinkings. Um, and I recently was hit with a question about German U-boats being sunk close to shore, which I've heard since the day I started my job and I've never seen any documentation. But hopefully someday we'll find something. 
Uh, but people don't think about a ship's uh, shipwrecks. They don't live just alike as a ship. They get transformed. So if you look in the upper left, that's the Nancy, wrecked on Nantasket Beach, uh, was turned into an advertising billboard, <laughs> as well as a, an amusement. They charged people, I think, a nickel or a dime to climb up and walk on top of the wreck until it was wiped out during the 1938 hurricane. Uh, and keep it on the recreational theme. In the bottom left is the Jenny M. Carter up on Salisbury Beach. You can see people, there's a little bit of the wreck visible, even today's wreck visible, but people hanging all over it. And they're visiting it, they're experiencing a shipwreck, which I don't discourage people from doing. You can't do any more damage to it than nature's done unless you're bringing a chainsaw. And they become habitat. People forget that vessels, when they sink, that they function in, in for us as humans and as us as a natural environment, continues. They're, they become a substrate, a platform for which fish use it for shelter, uh, a nursery. Sea anemones use it as a place to capture other creatures to eat. Nice gardens they create. They, they look fantastic. In fact, when I first visited the Portland site, the SS Portland site in the late 90s, the cod on that vessel that hung on, hung on the decks of that vessel were probably three feet long. You don't see three foot cod too often. They're not there anymore because the fishermen, once they kind of recognize that it's a good cod habitat, they get as close as they can. And there were no hangs, no abandoned gear on that vessel, or very little when we looked at it the first time. Now it's got a lot of litter on it. Uh, so it kind of function becomes a problem. Uh, so just to sort of give you an idea of maritime archaeology, it's, it's a lot of things. It's just not ships. I don't deal with shipwrecks exclusively. In fact, I'd probably be bored to death if I did, because I don't get to go out and actually experience them. I have to do this from a desk for the most, most of the time, or a couple of artifacts on a desk. Uh, but here you, you see some of the variety. Uh, you may or may not recognize the top right. That's Little Misery Island. That's the city of, the, most likely the city of Rockland, though, um, the dimensions aren't, don't quite match. A little bit small for the city of Rockland. Uh, aircraft, we probably have a good known, it's going to be 12 to 15 World War II training <coughs> losses. People forget that almost anything, any place you could land a plane, they were training pilots. They weren't just doing it in Quonset and in Weymouth. They had naval stations everywhere to train these small squadrons, and there's a lot of fatalities. Uh, a lot of lost vessels. Also, we look at the past environment, and in Buzzards Bay, that's, a, that's a, an interpretation of the bathymetry, and then taken back with sub-bottom sub profiles, a type of instrument that can look at the bottom structure of the, of the ocean bottom, and you can actually see that it's a, basically a huge river valley, that down the center of Buzzards Bay was a river valley that terminated in probably several lakes about 20,000 years ago, to about 15,000, maybe 12,000 years ago. And other structures like wharfs, jetties, harbor works, lighthouses, these are all archaeological sites, marine archaeological sites, that fall under the board's jurisdiction. I, I should have told you this, that under state law, we own it all. It doesn't matter if you own the pond. If there's something on there that's cultural, under state law, we own it. Not like the Historic Commission, it has no ownership rights. We, we do. Uh, but in any event, don't exercise them too readily, because it's not a lot of work to feed that table. Uh, there are a lot of sites that aren't underwater that are marine. And sometimes because of filled tide lands, they show up or they're related to that environment, they have a tide. So if you're starting with the she Seaport District shipwreck, which is only a couple of years ago discovered, uh, about I think it's about 150 Seaport Avenue, <coughs> or whatever. One of the new high rises going down in there. It's all filled tide lands. They actually only discovered this wreck by accident. Because they go through, we do research, filled tide lands, you know what structures were there, nothing there. They, they're doing their excavation, and the way they build, they don't dig the big pits. They actually put the, they put the pilings in first and then excavate down around them. And they got to a certain point, and you can see it's probably about 30 feet down, 40 feet down, they started to see white powder. And they got a little nervous, because they were thinking more likely has this material like asbestos. But 
they happen to have their offices in the adjacent building at about eight or nine stories up, and looking down, they notice it's kind of an odd shape, and click, it looks like a ship. And when they went out there, they realized that it was a wood outline around this white powder, which turned out to be lime. To give you an idea of how intense lime fires can be, there's a cask, a half cask. We found no whole casks. These are laid laterally. They're not vertical, they're laid laterally on the side. <coughs> that half cask is at the very bottom of the bilge. They don't carry ballast. They carry cargo. And they carry cargo in the worst ship they can <coughs> find, because they might catch fire. <laughs> Would you think that that might be a consideration, that you might want a more secure vessel? No, they take the oldest vessels and they use them. We don't, we haven't dated this vessel. We found material that kind of puts it in the late 1800s, but it's not clear. Could be intrusive material. But that fire was so intense, you could still see the char, the charcoal, you could still see lime, but it must have got to that point where it was completely no oxygen at all covered, <laughs> and then eventually covered as fill. On to sort of jump back in time, we have fish wears. People don't think about. We think about sometimes a shad run, a alewife runs today, uh, herring runs is a very common thing. But what we don't realize is ancient native peoples also exploited those resources. And those remnants are there. So many times, if you see stone going across a creek, it's probably not, even though I do the same thing, I'm not my sister's place in Maine, I'm putting the rocks across the creek, but the kids have a little pond playing. It was more likely a fish weir, a fish trap. Uh, this is one in East Bridgewater, which actually has colonial ties. It's actually <coughs> talking about um, looking at old uh, landmarks to do property boundaries. This actually is a property boundary and a colonial deed. Uh, it's still there today. Um, we actually have a student that's using that as a part of a certi certificate program to document that site. And then tide notes. I was really shocked. I always thought you need a lot of water behind the tide mill. You don't know how many creeks had tide mills on. I'm amazed how often I'm finding a new tide mill location on very small flowing creeks. This one in uh, West Gloucester is still visible through an aerial photographs. You can actually look and see the stone across there. That stone that's spread across that is the old dam. Above, below this, uh, upstream of this dam, actually is a dam today in our, in our road. Post states this. This was a uh, Haskell Burnham tide mill, was I think lumber, a lumber mill. And, that, and that's what most of the colonial mills were. Not really grist, more lumber. Uh, Archaeology is searching for, for, for me, it's searching for shipwrecks, so it's very systematic. We just don't go out willy nilly and, oh, let's go out, we'll dive here, we'll look. We, we have to sort of do it systematically. This is a survey from the Neptune um, gas pipeline that was never used. It's going to be decommissioned, I think, in the next year. But they did find some shipwrecks. Uh, this shipwreck, which we're going to talk about in a little while, was pretty unique to us because the way it broke, it just, it looks unusual. Turns out that it's just the way it broke up. It just kind of, when it hit the bottom, it kind of popped. But it looked like it had wings on it. And I'll tell you, I had sent in this image around to colleagues. We were all confused until we got down and got some images and saw that it was just unusual breakage. Uh, still an unidentified vessel, but in side scan images, you get a little bit of different um, uh, different images of it. So we go out and we search for shipwrecks, and on the same survey, we went looking for another shipwreck. This isn't that one, but another one of the unnamed vessels, or as we thought was unnamed, we went out, we did an ROV survey, a remotely operated vehicle. It's basically a camera on a tether that's like a robot and goes down like a sub. And we got some images, but when they got down on the wreck, um, we saw something unusual. It was a new line and a shiny chain. No one expect to find that in an old shipwreck. <laughs> kind of got you suspicious. And it wouldn't have been so suspicious sometimes new line, lock the trap, set its tongue out. But the chain kind of got us. So we went back and we got the numbers off of the pot. Numbers had expired. Fortunately for me, we have connections in marine fisheries and environmental police, so we can run the numbers. Guy lives a half a mile from where I live. Had his phone number, called him, told me what the wreck was. Said I could put a lobster pot on so all the people wouldn't dive that site. He was using it for charter. He'd take out people to dive that site. They'd look at it. No problem. They weren't collecting, which was good. That would be illegal. Diving and visiting the site is not. 
but he had tied it off on the site, which we don't think is acceptable, but I'm not really so concerned about that. But we found out it was a Breton Reef lightship. Now, what is the Breton Reef lightship doing up here in Salem Sound? <laughs> you might ask. I asked. And it turns out it was being brought up here in the 60s. They were going to convert it to a restaurant. How many times they, I, I mean, this is a very common story. We're going to take that old boat, and we're going to convert it to a restaurant. They don't really take off too well. Um, I'll tell you, after sitting on the Milo, the old ferry up in Portland, it was the most uncomfortable dinner I ever had with that rolling bag. But in any event, on the way into to Beverly to be, to be converted, she sank. Which is unfortunate, I think, because it, it, it's an interesting vessel. And being number um, 29, the, the numbers have to do with the hull design and when the hulls are registered. Being number 29 was an early boat. She's a wooden vessel. Uh, they, they basically, in the 30s, picked all the wooden vessels out of service and converted them to iron. I wouldn't want that duty, period. I would not want to be a light ship uh, uh, sailor. Because when we, a lot of sites aren't quite visible. As you, so the illustration, here's what's visible. That's what's not visible. And we do it like land archaeology. We set up grids. The diver goes down, records, and collects information. But they do find odd things. This is a concretion or conglomerate. This is a, probably a 50-gallon tub, so tub about this big. And the concretion is probably like this. And we don't know. And concretions are what happens is a chemical reaction with irons in, in, the, in, the, in the bottoms. It, it, it concretes, becomes a very hot surface. Sometimes it's natural materials. Sometimes it's artificial. So we don't know. So in this case, they got an industrial x-ray. And they saw all these straight lines. Well, in nature, you don't see straight lines. In man-made products, you see straight lines. So got us suspicious. Got the permit holder suspicious. Said we'll do. We have to do excavation of the concretion, and they do again the same thing. They do it in a very systematic fashion. Uh, in this case, they did a series of breaking that concretion down, taking chunks off, and eventually found a gun plate. So, so you can idea what gun plates look like. What I want to point out, which I found, I'm fascinated by, is the fact that she's this really nice watch <laughs> and this really nice diamond ring. <laughs> I know that. I'm not wearing my, I, I lost my wedding band somewhere. No, no, it doesn't fit anymore. So I'm wearing my grandfather's ring because he had bigger hands. Uh, but in any event, I would not wear my ring in the field, especially doing this. This is all chemical reduction, a lot of water. And that's not a cheap watch. When you can see the real close-up image, it's a Cartier. She's, she's, she's well healed. At least her husband is. I don't know her mother. I'm not sure. But this was a stage photograph. So you know, instead of just doing all the person's work, I think, oh, we've got to do something today. So archaeologists, we all get amused by that part of it. But it's kind of cool what she found in this bag. Turned out the bag was gun parts, all gun parts. And it was an international bag of gun parts. There were English, which they anticipated. There were Spanish and Portuguese, which they thought they might find one or two pieces, but good portion. Dutch, stuff that may be Baltic area, could be Swedish, could be um, German, even some Italian, Venetian stuff, even some Islamic parts. What people don't think about, we think about global trade as this modern, you know, 20, 21st century concept. It's been forever. As soon as you had maritime commerce, you had global trade. And it, it sort of made it much better than land trade, because you could do it faster and cheaper. So I always tell Students, especially, that they better think about this concept. It's always been there. It's not new. It's just like credit. They didn't travel with cash, by the way. Letters of, letters of credit was the most common thing. Very few people carry cash. So those, those payrolls, they don't exist. Uh, this is what I find. Lots of stuff. When we excavate a shipwreck, this is the. This shipwreck has no artifacts on it, by the way. This is the ADK Dame and an Ipswich. But. If you see the variety of things, we can find leather. These are shoes from a Revolutionary War shipwreck. Uh, assorted materials brought up by a couple of draggers off on George's Bank. I, I like the Chianti bottle. You know, it's like, it's a, the, wood, the, the, the basket's gone, but the bottle still exists. And there's a little uh, oil um, can. Lots of diverse materials, but 
these, the fishermen find stuff, they know where the shipwrecks are, or they know where my shipwreck might be. That we'll look at the charts and they'll show us where they hanged up, and we got no records for anything out there. So when, when something's lost at sea, a shipwreck, it can be really lost uh, for good. On this item on the bottom, I, I love this object. It came out of Boston Harbor on a, on a wreck, a, a lime schooner that sank out in the harbor. But there's, I always ask, and once in a while I get someone that actually knows what it is. But it took us a while because it looks like a, it's probably about this big. Looks like it had two handles, so like a vase, you know. And then we looked at the maker's mark, which then helped us identify and date it. Maker's mark gave us a manufacturer. Uh, no, it's not a chamber pot. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it looks like it had a lid. So we started looking in the, in the catalog. I was surprised to see what it was. Does anyone have an idea what this, this vessel would have been? Sauerkraut? No. 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 Probably could have been used. Not a spittoon, no. Lump sugar. It's a sugar bowl. Oh. It's lump sugar. So I used to granulated sugar, and I think of my grandmother's and my mother's you know, sugar bowl, it's small. So that's kind of neat. And we bring that to classes and show them, uh, let the kids hold that. Uh, some of the shipwrecks that are unusual, this is up in the Merrimack River, just, just below the Groveland Bridge. What, this actually is a light ship. It wasn't up there functioning as a light ship. It was used by the Sea Scouts, it was given to the the, the ski scouts and sea scouts and cable obtained it. They purchased it in the 30s, and they had a lot of trouble with it. So they gave it to the poor kids down on the farms in Roblin for their sea scouts. And how the world has changed in, in terms of economics. And eventually, in 1936, not the 38, because the 36 floods, it was dragged from its moorings and ended up on this beach. And they said, this is it. It has a really checkered history. We're not dragging it back. It's always breaking moorings. We'll get a different training vessel. And it was abandoned there. And to the point where that tree is actually growing out of the wreck. I really should give you the image of the other side so you can see it. But that tree is growing out of the wreck. So at high, when the, and that's the tidal portion of the river. So at high tide, you see a tree and maybe a little dirt. You don't see the rest. It's been incorrectly identified as the light vessel form number one, which is a 120 foot vessel. This is an 80-foot vessel. You're not going to take a, an old, built in the 1850s, you're not going to cut that down 30 feet, put it together, and sail it. <coughs> this is probably the LV-5, 7, or 9. They were sold out of service. LV-1 sold out of service in Savannah, Georgia. Again, why would you bring it all the way up to Boston? 5, 7, and 9 are sold out in Boston. They're all about that dimension. Two of those are used as lighters. This has huge iron tanks in it, so it's probably one of those vessels. But um, Graham McKay at Lowell's Boat Shop has researched this vessel. That was his master's thesis. Uh, he still hasn't determined which vessel it is. So it's a mystery we both eventually solve. Really want to figure out what happened to the one. Um, I believe it turned out to be kind of a jetty structure outside of Savannah, but we have never been able to prove that. Uh, I talked a little bit earlier about aircraft loss. This is kind of an interesting photograph because you see, the ch again, the transformation of a vessel's life. This is the James Longstreet Liberty, um, the Liberty ship. Early in its career, it broke its back. Uh, went from the na Naval Service, or actually went from the Merchant Service, the U.S. Merchant Service, transferred to the Navy as a target vessel. So in the 40s, it's brought out to Billingsgate area and Cape Cod Bay, and it ends up into the 60s looking like it does at the bottom here on, on, on the left. Side scan shows it's a lot of image. The side scan image shows there's a lot of structure there. But what I found when we came across this photograph, this, this is the, actually a photograph of a practice bombing run. This vessel was used to test out what they called the BAT. The BAT was an air to ground heat seeking missile. And they tested it out on this site. So for me, it's sort of from a military point of view, it's got a significance. That way, it, it would have lost as a just another uh, Liberty ship. So it's kind of a neat site. There's a lot there. Um, we allow collecting on this site. The downside is it's a target site, 
and there's a lot of unexploded ordnance. <laughs> and I can't believe this. All guys who set, set their lobster traps there, and I can't believe that something hasn't happened uh, to, to their equipment. And uh, let's see. Now this is the basal. It's a fishing vessel. Uh, she's Canadian built. This is in Chilmar, so the bottom part of um, Cape Cod towards Gayhead, that that side of uh, Martha's Vineyard. What's interesting to me about this, we, we couldn't figure out what part of the structure we had until we actually used the back hose to lift the structure up to look at it. They're going to try to pull it up horizontally, but they couldn't, so they turned it on its side. And then you can see, that's why I've got the picture of the transom, the vessel's transom stern. So we've got the starboard stern quarter of the vessel is still there. Uh, what's kind of fun is this is buried in the beach. They, I mean, they literally had to get the back hose out, dig off several feet of sand, to remove the vessel, which was then dissembled. They got it, they, the plan was to then reassemble it at the Martha's Vineyard Museum, but it's sitting in a barn, last I heard. I don't know if I want to do that. Come back. This is what I wanted. But if you look here, so here you get the star, you get the stern post, and it still has the the um, the pins that held it, the gudgeons and the pin posts. When I went to look at that, and you see how shiny now? This came out of the bottom. This wasn't like sitting up on the surface. This was way deep buried. First time seen since probably the 20s. You can see the saw marks where someone had taken a hacksaw and cut those off by hand to recover that the pintle and gunman system to sell that brass or reuse that brass. Um, so vandalism occurred when it wrecked. Uh, the, most of the vessel wrecked about a quarter mile offshore, and some of the remains are out there, but we haven't, we assume are out there, but we haven't found them yet. This same vessel, the same family still built boats, but they built lobster boats. And they're still building in Nova Scotia around the same area that this was built. And there's actually a wreck up there. It'd be kind of fun from the archaeologist's point of view to look at that wreck and this wreck and compare the construction. Because they're contemporaries. I think that wreck's uh, just maybe five years younger. Of course, our history goes way back. Uh, and we find remnants of it in different forms in different places. So, for example, we're finding that the offshore, the, the, the ocean bottom lands that we see today, so the shelf, the close in shelf, 13,000 to 20,000 years ago was dry land. And to sort of indicated it's dry land, they find a lot of what they call mega, Pleistocene megafauna, mastodon, mammoth, uh, rhino, uh, sloth, but recently, um, a project came up with just two recent dragger finds of both mammoth and mastodon. You put within um, 10 miles of shore, probably almost within the, not quite within state waters, that far off of Salisbury. And there's a, a mammoth tooth to, to show you one. This one of, came off about 50 miles off of P-Town, Provincetown. Other, other indicators of shoreline change and past environments, in the right-hand side, you're, you're seeing cedar trunks. Uh, cedar root structures, cedar tree root structures. This is at Cape, uh, South Cape Beach in Mashpee. These date to about 2,000 years ago. Cedar is not, it's a, it's a coastal species, but it's not a saltwater species. So if you look at marshes today, you see all that dead structure along the shoreline. <coughs> That's this. That was a freshwater pond at some point in time at this, at this location. And as sea level rose, and the beach retreated inland. That became saltwater environment, killed the trees, eventually got buried, and then storm action recently has uncovered it. We haven't found any artifacts at this site. We didn't do an intensive survey either, but no artifacts have been found, so we can't associate it with native peoples, but it certainly indicates an environment that would have been exploited. Uh, but looking with ancient peoples, uh, Lake Quinsigamon, so most times people think of my job and it's the ocean. It's every place that's got water on it in Massachusetts. It's a river, stream, pond. I've looked at more culverts than you know exist because <laughs> the water flows through them. This is in Lankman Sigamon in Shrewsbury, Worcester Line. Uh, we um, worked with the Nipmuc Nation, which is a state recognized Native American tribe. There are three dugout canoes. This one has been dated to 1660. So right about the time that the Plymouth colony was doing Krishnai's village structure, and it's right on the outside edge of that, because Worcester is beyond the frontier. 
was just like no man's land. <laughs> you know? And it was like that till about 1700. They had, during the Indian Wars, it, it was a devastated village and people didn't go back right away. But in this case, we've got this nice dugout. Dugouts are basically tree logs that the tree is girdled, chopped down, girdling kills it, so it makes it easy to chop it. And when it's chopped down, they will take and adds out a little bit of the top uh, along the longitudinal structure, then burn it, adds the ash, uh, charcoal out, and keep doing this so you get a hollowed out log. Uh, when I was first contacted about it, I figured, you just found a hollowed out log in the lake, buddy. Yeah. So you know, we don't really have a dugout canoe you know, until we got some images uh, and, so, and, and looked at it. But anyway, what they would do is with these logs, once it's so labor intensive and wood deteriorates, as you know, uh, without preservatives, they would use it d during the uh, spring, summer, fall season. In the winter, they they sink them. That's a this is an ethnographically known process. It's not something we invented. It's on people. And then in the spring, they take the stone out and float, dry them all over, and they float again. These, unfortunately, are now at 26 feet depth in the lake, well beyond most free diving to take rock out and float it up. And I'll tell you, there's a wicked thermal climb. It goes from about 60 to 65 degrees in the first 10 feet of water to 38. So it's like, bang. I didn't have a good experience with that. <laughs> what I like about this wreck, and it is a wreck, what is kind of fun is if you look in here, and you can't really see it too well in this image, but there's a, there's a bottle, green. We know they drank Heineken. <laughs> <laughs> We actually found frisbees out there, 50 gallon drums, tires, the whole project. Uh, when we first saw this image, before we dove it, it was like, there's a skull down there. Got yeah. down there, that's a really neat rock. <laughs> and you can't see the seat too well on this one either. I got to work on these photographs again. This actually has a seat like this car did. It's kind of fascinating. Uh, we were just out there in July. We could look at two of, the, two of them, but we couldn't find the third one, the area. We don't know. The landowner said nothing's been done there, but the properties have changed a little bit, a little more moorings. Uh, it may have just been taken out as rotted wood. Were these like 25, 30 feet long? No, these are short. These are about 14, 15 foot. Um, half the, 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 what I would call the bow is buried in, in, on these two. There's two that are near each other. The other one, can't tell stern from bow on it. It's so deteriorated. Um, but they're small, but you got to think of Lake Constrictment isn't it's like a half a mile across. You don't need a huge depth. So they do have cuts in the gunnels, which suggests double canoes to pair. But, and I've seen photographs of paired canoes, but I've never seen it archaeologically. So I don't know if that's the case. It just, we thought about canoe clubs, which were very prevalent late 19th century up into the 30s. But they tended to do bark boats. We don't we couldn't find evidence of anyone doing dugouts on the lake, just bark. So um, this is local. This log is in a marsh. But if you look really closely, this log has mortise and tenon joints in it, pegs in it. And we were fortunate, a gentleman was looking at one of these um, historic properties there. And it used to have a bridge in 1665 in Essex. A bridge which was necessary to go from the village of Shabako, Essex, to Ipswich to go to church, which you had to do every Sunday. And the only way of getting out to go into es Ipswich was to have a meeting house in Essex. They were very lucky that in 1665 or 6, that bridge was washed out in an ice flow. <laughs> so they got their own parish. Uh, but it's kind of cool because we knew, knew from a genealogist doing the research and looking at the location, and him going out kayaking one day and just saying, this spot just is in a weird spot. And you find logs and marshes all the time. They're always buried. So you can look at the accumulation built over this log in 300 years. So it gives us an indication of the sedimentation in, in the marsh. But also, the, the, there's a sort of a stereotypic view of how this would have been built. I mean, this is the structures we could find or in pink. We didn't go further in. We don't have the instrumentation to actually do remote sensing further in the marsh. 
And I'm going to tell you, I wouldn't want to dig that stuff, especially in the summertime with the green heads of the mosquitoes. So <laughs> great to see you. Lighthouses, probably don't know, we have a shipwreck lighthouse, so to speak. Um, Minus Lens Lighthouse, everybody that sails is pretty familiar with the, the granite structure that's there today on Minus Ledge. It's called the Lover's Light because of the, the yeah, the I love you, the, the one full of three light system. However, it's not the first lighthouse there. There was a lighthouse there 10 years earlier. It was an iron um, skeleton structure. It took about 10 years to build. They started doing it in the 1840s. Um, 1850, it was put into service. And immediately, the keeper complained about how dangerous it felt to them. That it, sw they, it was thought by the engineer that it was going to, water would flow through it. Because he'd gone over to Britain and Europe to see lighthouses in construction. And the Brits had been talking about building these for Eddystone Light, which is also a huge stone lighthouse today. Originally, it was going to be an iron one. And they came to the realization, this is not going to work. However, Engineer Swift, appropriate name, did not <laughs> catch on to that fact. He built this. It does really, we have some really excellent drawings of the, the idealized structure, so we know what it looks what it looked like. Um, but unfortunately, it toppled in 1851. Uh, in March of 1851, and I don't have the dates written down. I usually do, but I was neglectful today. It, it had a severe storm. So we had, like we do now, and we get those nor'easters coming up in the spring, and it had a harrowing one. And the keeper, Bennett, at the time, and he had two assistants, um, Antoine and um, Wilson, they threw a message in a bottle over the side. Um, and basically, we're, we're going to, basically says, we're going to die doing our duty. And they survived. But that message came ashore. <laughs> Unfortunately, a month later, Bennett was on shore. Anecdotal stories, don't complain again. Probably just normal, get off the lighthouse and come to shore. But Wilson and Antoine were still there. April storm comes up. They throw a message in the bottle. Basically, it won't last till morning. And the next morning, that bottle's gone several days later, but the next morning, no one could see minus light. And then over the next couple of days, both bodies washed ashore. One close, one much further away. Um, I don't know if it was by 10 miles, but one of them went up the coast. Uh, not a travel line trip he wanted to make. Um, we did find structure. We did a project with the U.S. Coast Guard. Uh, as always, when I get free labor and collaboratives, there's always some glitch. The Coast Guard, this time, had just had a major diving accident in the Arctic. So our divers could not dive with their divers. So we had to dive separate projects to try to coordinate them. Even though we had a diver who was trained as an archaeologist who was a reservist coastie. Nice. But we got transferred to do his two weeks duty in Boston rather than on the Great Lakes. Uh, but anyway, they did get out, and after some field training, they did find portions of what we believe are from the lighthouse. This looks like a cast iron steel pipe. Shouldn't be any pipes out there. But we did find an iron beam. That's probably from later construction. This looks like one of the arms that would have been used to support the upper structure of the, of the building, which was wood and iron. Uh, looks like This looks like a spoke tub. And these are two Coast Guardsmen who had been instructed that you don't look up to find things, because they're used to looking at the bottom of hulls. Because these are guys that go into inspections, not so much for safety in the everyday sense, but for, shall we say, unauthorized attachments to the bottom of vessels that might explode. Uh, but they, they, they did start to get, get the hang of it, and they did find some of these things and learned how to measure. It was kind of fun to work with them. And they were from all over the U.S. They volunteered, or I should say they requested that transfer, because they worked together in small units to come together as a larger unit of eight, six to eight men, usually working teams of two to three. Uh, they came all of us to put this, basically to put this monument down uh, by the foundation. And it went up in that sinker, and we got a nice picture of that day. Um, and then we went back to locate it, and we couldn't find it. Yeah. Uh, about a month later. And, you know, <coughs> it's 
sometimes it's using GPS. We put a lot of faith in technology. We also got to think about <coughs> when you use a GPS, it's where that instrument's antenna is. When you're on a, a on a large vessel, that antenna is usually tied to somewhere around the bridge. You don't offload the cargo from a buoy tender at the bridge. It's somewhere off the side of the vessel, so many degrees off. But we didn't know that, so we had a general idea. Search couldn't find it. Went back for years, couldn't find it. Rumor mill, it's been stolen. Well, the stolen rumor mill is usually has the other side where you find out who stole it. And because they can't keep the secret. And then divers, that network is they like to brag. Let's still, I'd be frank, they, they, that information flows, it never flowed. Two firemen are out lobstering in that area. They dive and collect lobster illegally, and it's very popular for that, and sort of surprising. So about six years later, these guys are out there diving, and he sees about a piece of metal that's probably about six by six sticking out of a black. It's a piece of black, I'd say metal. He, he thought it was just flat, um, like, car not carpet, but some kind of rubber fabric. And he went off and he said, on the way back, they, they sort of remembered, hey, let's get that trash, because they were always picking up trash. He went to pick it up, and he realized, this isn't a piece of rubber or whatever, it's metal. And he, when he brought it out, he was shocked. Came to the local dive shop, and as I do, the room mill doesn't stop. That information flowed within days to my office, so we got back in touch, talked to them, and they were thrilled to find out why it was there, how it got there, and that they could turn it back. We still don't put it back in the water, but that's the plan, to get that back in the water. There's a land side memorial, but it's, I think the uniqueness of having a, the memorial, memorial right where these people perished would be so much nicer, and it'd make an interesting dive. And it makes great photos if this was not so dark. Um, and I talked a little bit about sea level rise, and most people don't realize that there's a shoal off of, off of wealthy called Billingsgate. Billingsgate Shoal used to be Billingsgate Island up until about 1900. And the lighthouse keeper in the late 1890s, or I should say in the 1890s, 1880s, kept a record of the slowly creeping water level coming up to the lighthouse. So finally, the village was abandoned uh, in the early 1900s. The buildings were removed. There's places around the cave. The foundations are still there. The lighthouse light is, I believe, somewhere in Lake Michigan. The building itself is probably just someone's using it as a home somewhere in Wealthy or Truro or East Ham. But its foundation is there. And this image doesn't show them really clearly, but there are these marks are where foundation pieces are found and other material. So for me, it'd be a fun project to want to go out and do the documentation there and then look at the buildings where they are today and come back. But it's, this is, when we talk about sea level rise and climate change, it's a real example of, of what happens. And that's gradual. So I kind of believe in it. Um, only one thing. I mentioned this wreck, you saw that earlier when I was saying wrecking shipwrecks versus wrecking events, uh, or wrecking ships. This is an unknown shipwreck fragment on Newcomb's Hollow, Fault Fleet, I think just beyond Marconi if you know that area, but it's within the Park Service. Park Service sent down its architectural historian to document this. Really nice diagram, nice cross section. Unfortunately, as a maritime archeologist, I like to know where the pegs are, where the seams are, where the frames come together, where the planks come together, and that's almost all missing. So we were trying to figure this out. We're looking at this, and it's like, this is the weirdest keel I ever saw. We really, we had to get out and, of course, we have to do archaeology because we're archaeologists, have to dig holes. Especially if you have free student labor. Because I don't do that stuff anymore. And we did some activities. We also did what I like to do and the Park Service doesn't do. If you do real time interpretation for people, you're walking down the beach, you see us working, I'll drag you over and tell you stories. <laughs> you know? And we don't have a copper plate out there either. But in any event, we, we, we had a lot of people come by. It was nice to do the interpretation because I want you to come visit a shipwreck. If you go out and see this, this is what a shipwreck is. It's not the stuff, unfortunately, we see on TV and in the movies. I never see those. I've never, I, I, I have been to the Mary Rose in England, and that's the kind of shipwreck I'd like to find. 
And we probably have those, but I'm never going to find them here. Uh, but in any event, this is a real strip wreck. And we finally figured out where we were because, as you can see that red arrow, we found, as we excavated around that, we found it in the frame, we found the limber hole. We knew that this was more like a barge, more flat bottom, and that we were right at that point of the turn of the bilge from, it separated from the keel, the keel is probably off somewhere offshore, so we knew what section we had. We don't know whether it's starboard or, or, or forward on the vessel. Uh, and other things, the key, the fun part for me, I, I, I look at a lot of wreckage on the That's probably when I get the feel. What, what was fun for me on this is that you can actually see the water line. There's the stain from the water line. And most of the time we get out there, and I just see a piece of section of hull. I can't tell you where it is unless, because usually the bow and the stern don't seem to break off and float up onto the beach. So you usually don't know where you're on the ship. And typically when we find buried vessels, we're getting from the village down, below the water line. So it's nice to get structure above that the long, the, long, the long outer planking that's coming towards the arrow, second visit we went out to finish measuring, had been cut off. Which for me was, you know, this vandalism, I would have liked to caught the guy, except we won't get the money from the top fine in prison time. But for us it was neat because we could actually see that this was coming towards the stern. We actually knew where we were because the planks were at angle at their ends so as they could fit many pieces as they came in. So it was so probably a trans a transom stern vessel as well. So we lost that. And just to give you an idea of what we're looking at, so the top diagram gives you an idea of of where this piece of wreckage on the left is, and for an example, the Jenny Carter, of the shipwreck, it's still visible at Salisbury. Uh, we're looking at that area below to get that kind of different view of a vessel. Don't always have that experience on shipwrecks. Uh, we had a very, un, um, Coffin's Beach, or sometimes mis called Winger Sheet, uh, we came up with a very unusual vessel, uh, probably not quite five years ago, on a call, I got a wreck out here, do you know what it is? And I do get those calls, and most of the time I haven't a clue what wreck they have. I have a clue about 20 wrecks that might be there, but not the wreck. And as we talked to them, we did research, we think, oh, it's an early gill netting, which we need because gill netting came to this area in the, I think, the teens or the 20s. It's not originally from here, it's a Great Lakes fishery that was brought in. So it'd be kind of cool to look at one of those vessels. But when we got out and looked at it and then diagrammed it out, roughly diagrammed it out, I said, this is blunt. This is like a, almost as a flat bow and a flat, and we couldn't really find, but it turned out we couldn't find the stern at all. But we went out and started to look at it and it started to have those characteristics of what we would think early construction. And having other people come out and look at it, so we have colleagues, um, Graham McKay came down, Carol Burrow came down and said, look at the wreck, they're going like, this doesn't fit what we normally find for a schooner wrecks. And then we saw some other components. We looked at the, if we looked at the stem, that stem piece, this is one solid piece. This isn't, you, you're looking at basically sparking and rabbits. You're not looking at, and cracks. You're not looking at pieces put together, composite. This, this is like 15 inches this way and 15 inches that way. And it's just got this little cutout in it. Well, there's a, there's a period of time when they took and added bowsprits. <coughs> so this is probably a Shabako boat that had a bowsprit added to it. What was also, for me, really exciting is we got a Roman 5, I mean a Roman 6, and then below it, somewhere in here, a Roman 5. So we knew we had six foot of boat underneath where we were excavating. Unfortunately, we're right at the negative tide line, so it's always wet. You can clean it out, and within a second, it's, it seems dry. Uh, within a second, it's filled back up. We can't keep it dry, so we have to build a copper dam away for maybe a negative two foot tide, which will happen eventually, and get it filled up. But in doing some hand probing, which I wouldn't recommend, but then again, we were excited. We came up, we, we were trying to see if we could feel the keel, because we would. We kept excavating, we kept moving, trying to see if we could find the stern. We did see a reverse curve in some of the frames. So we're starting to say, hey, we're, we're, we've, got a, we've, got a, we've got a stern, whether it's a dog body or a, 
or around it, Sterling wasn't sure. But as we were trying to find the keel, we found some ballast. And amongst the ballast, we found brain coral. Well, there are actually hard corals in New England. They're not offshore. They're not, look, they're not brain coral. Brain coral is a Caribbean species. So it got us really excited because usually coral is brought back as cargo. It's chunks, like cut chunks, not nodules. So it's because they cut it and easier to pack. Nodules actually take up more space. So it's loose nodules. There's a lot of, there's a mix and match and stuff. So this is ballast. Most likely, this is a this vessel made it to the Caribbean at some time in its life. And the reason why we speculate that way because there's this trade between sort of Gloucester, Salem, colonial trade to early, early Europe, to the early Republic between our area, our region, and the Caribbean, and Surinam in particular. So you got this trade route. This vessel may have been part of that. Uh, one of my students that works with me, when I call my students and my interns that belong to some university I get for free and I put them to work and abuse them heavily with crazy projects. He used this as his, as his master's project for the University of Southern Denmark. He was really excited when he realized that this was a transitional vessel, that it was going, this had been converted to a bowsprit just before it wrecked, or not just before, but in its career, so it's at this time of transition, probably around the time of the revolution to the early republic, that later part of the, of the 18th century, I prefer to be earlier because I want an earlier boat. You know, I don't want the Sparrowhawk to be the only early boat found you know, before I leave the system. Um, it, would it, it could date these things, carbon dating and all that kind of stuff? It would mean that I'd have to have a budget. <laughs> we actually tried to take wood floors out of this. We've actually had to take a couple samples, not enough rain to trade. Dendro actually would be better. Because what happens with carbon dating, if you get this, we could get a date range. But with that, usually the date range, if you get sort of past colonization, the date plus or minus is, we're talking hundreds of years sometimes. So the range is huge. So even if you pick a good date, even with the dugout canoe at 1660, I think it's plus or minus 40 on each end. And that was the best date. They actually had a date in the 19, 19-something. But the lab said, you know, that date just some erroneous thing. But in this case, we, we did some dendro. The sample did not have enough rings. You need at least 30. Despite, this is like watching, you know, the crime investigative DNA show. <laughs> you know, treating dating is the same. You've got to have a good sample, and the person's got to be able to, we haven't even been able to type it. They think it might be a white oak, but they're not sure. And not a white oak, a red oak, which is, ugh. You know, but it, again, it's so deteriorated, that person can't necessarily make that judgment and had insufficient number of rings. They had less than 30, and so couldn't do it. And this stuff was dense. I could not get the, um, the, the core to get in at all. We were ended up with fine grain material and not a core the first time in, in that stem piece. So we went back. Into the, in the stem, we took we took samples in this area of it, and I'll tell you, it just wouldn't work. We're gonna have to, if we go back, we'll have to do the really crude chisel sampling because it'll take a bigger hole. It won't be neat, but it will get us a good sample because you can use a chisel to, to actually break that surface. It makes me happy that it has such integrity, but this has been a very wreck. This wreck, the collective memory on Coffins Beach of the residents we talked to went back about 85 years. No one ever saw anything out there. One person talked about a lobster boat out there. And there were some engine parts about 100 yards from where we were. So to me, y'all talking about that vessel. You think you have this vessel. They're not the same. I know enough about ship structure to know they're not the same. Um, but in any case, we hope to get back and do some more work on that. And it's still, students still interested, even though he's finished, works for the right thing, created Joe's now. <laughs> we do training and volunteer opportunities. We try to do this. This has been one of my goals because of having limited resources and also wanting to capitalize on all that free labor. People love shipwreck. And there's lots of things people can do that, without a lot of training. So we've actually done uh, what we call ships, which is what we're importing. And this, I, I've used these, these photographs because this is, this is Manchester. This is a, a wreck that I've been looking at off and on for years. 
I just can't figure out what the hell it is. Excuse me. I can't figure out what, by God, it could be. But uh, in any event, and we also do training through the Nautical Archaeology Society, which is a, a UK-based group, but it's a certification program that's standard and it's really transferable. And we, we're, I'm part of the license holders for that training, so no one else can do those courses. Uh, except several colleagues through Bridgewater. Uh, this is that unknown site right by the, by the rotunda. Uh, what is really, there's no French, there is one cross piece, but here's, here's a stem or stern, and there are no French holding these planks up. When I first saw this in 88, 89, it wasn't very exposed, but the pieces that came through struck us as frames just popping up and really closely framed vessels, which usually used to heavy, heavy sailing. So a vessel doing sealing, like the Britannia, which is somewhere around here, uh, it, it, um, it's built to, for ice. It's built to go up against ice and rock while you're doing that, that work. And that's what it looked like to us. And then when we excavated, and these students are actually from Pecos, New Mexico, on an exchange program with Phillips Academy. So first time they were at the ocean, first time they did underwater or maritime archaeology, um, first time away from home, was a kind of a lot of first ones. They, they were great. Um, they really got into it. And I'd like to go back and do more work on this site to really see if I can determine it. Someone may come back and tell me, like one of the gentlemen that came out to visit us said, well, we were <coughs> He believes it's actually just a remnants of a workboat from some construction in the area that just got buried there. And because of the channelization, half of it's gone. And the channel comes right up there, you know, in, in close. But it, it's kind of fun. It's full of rock and stuff, but I find it interesting. And then we've done uh, not archaeology certification training. This is the city of Taunton Rec. The city of Taunton Rec basically in the 30s, it went out of service, and some storm action, and I don't think it was 38 hurricane. I don't believe it was, that was the date. Um, it broke its moorings on the Fall Riverside and drifted across the Somerset, where it was abandoned. And it was heavily stripped. Uh, you can see most of it. This is it today. You get a little bit of the print. Actually, this is about half of what we can see. The rest of it is under landfill. In the backyard, a couple of residents we found out recently. Because we could see the shape, but we couldn't, we couldn't, we weren't going to dig in their property, first of all. But we don't usually do excavation, we usually just do surface measuring. But we, but that was just sort of the anecdotal story. He told us that in the 50s, that was visible. That then was built tidelands. And when you look at the aerial photos, that shipwreck outline is perfect. That vessel's in the water. <laughs> in the 30s, like 38. And the next set of photos, which come in about the 60s, it's half, half there. Uh, so with training, we use a mock shipwreck. So we have our, our frames, our ribs, our keel, our floors, some trends, some longitudinal pieces. So they can train how to do measurements. And then we actually go out to the site. And in this case, here we get the frames and the students are I'm measuring these students for ages, I think, um, 40 to 70. It's, like, it's just a group of people that want the training. We could get it together. We're going to try to offer more of these courses, but it was one of these, let's get it done. We have some people interested that aren't taking our field school. And this is our field school. We've done through San Jose State for the past four years. We worked at the ADK Damon site in Ipswich for three of those years. And on both sides of the curtain, thankfully for the help of the trustees, they've allowed us to use their property. And um, we've had small classes, about 10 to 15 students. And the case of this vessel, and the, the Damon, it changes from season to season. I mean, one season, this is all that was visible. It's just this small set of, of um, the starboard frames. It, that was all that was visible, a little bit of the, of, the, of the stem. You couldn't even see the stern post. Another year, a lot of the stern and the stem were visible, and we could get in and see that it had ceiling planks and some unusual structure, but you could see modifications. Uh, last summer, th actually this group, is after field school, we still used the volunteers, went back and tried to measure up the stern. What we did, could determine, even though we already knew it, it was, um, had a rudder post, as opposed to a stern post. 
so that the rudder actually turned in a nice curve, little basin. Uh, unfortunately, the hinging was all gone uh, in the steering mechanism components, but it also showed signs of burning, but people picked it in. They, I mean, it's something. It's not, it's not a historically important vessel, but it shows us adaptive reuse of, of this resource. And actually, every time we've been there, I mean, if it's higher water, I've seen vessels anchored into it, which I eh, wish they wouldn't. But most people don't even know what's it. They think there's just something hard structure. And there's a, there's a groin just beyond it uh, that was put in probably in the 40s. So people think they might be on some remnant groin or whatever. And then this past summer, we worked at the city of Rockland site on Little Misery Island. And that was fun because, well, it's great to go to Crank the Crane Estate because we, I'll tell you, easy access and bathrooms. What <laughs> more can you do? Creature comforts, you know. This site, the bathroom meant wading across the channel between Little Misery and Misery Island, crossing the entirety of Misery Island to the comfort station on the other to the side. And our students would do that. You know, more power to them. Anything to get away from the site more. No. <laughs> it, it's kind of fun because it's this site is loaded with European oyster, which is edible but it's small, um, and a lot of crab. Again, too small to eat, but I, we saw the lobster. What was neat is that you have a lot of structure. We actually can see where the chocks are to hold up the frame, the A frame for the for the power system. The boiler, how the boiler works is still there, just like a frame for probably the water intakes, maybe the cover. Uh, but we have keel, keelsons, riders, lots of framing, uh, an empty cut that I keep going around. Uh, and it, it, they did a little bit of work in the water, so they did a little bit of snorkeling around some of the edges. It was a very convenient spot, and the bugs were down. We didn't have a lot of bugs there. A lot of poison ivy. They need to put some goats out on those islands. <laughs> and with that, um, I just want to say that uh, encountering history might just be a walk on the beach. So you may you may encounter it anytime you're out there. This is the Ingmar on at the Plum Island um, National Wildlife Refuge. It's from parking lot three, I think. It pops in and out of the sand regularly. That's my art shot in the bottom. Um, but it's a, it's a nice spot to work and work with the refuge staff is always is good fun. And this is, a, again, done as a project after class. We go out there if it's visible and that's it, but they can keep their training going. Uh, with that, I'm open to any questions. Still on my list of hmm. We've done. I've done some background research in the area. Can't kind of come up with anything that explains um, um, 
mod usage. And you gotta figure the island right off of there. Probably this was a, a pond system. That island was probably the outside bank, the ocean bank, and the sea level rise reached it. This is probably all cedar that died. And you've seen that in the swamp behind it now in the marsh. You get a little bit of that structure. How do you decide when a record of death and you take stuff off? That's usually, we, we, we look at the circumstances of um, usage. So if it's been dove quite, quite extensively and uh, collected heavily, previously collected heavily, and has lost what we would consider archaeological integrity either through uh, Army Corps flattening the record. That's usually what happens. Army Corps goes out, it's a hazard to navigation. They try to drop a wire drag, that doesn't work, so they pull the, the life out of it and flatten it out. And that's usually, it loses its structural integrity. And that's usually when we do that, that. And there are a lot of wrecks that could be added, but when they did this, they did this very quickly. For example, I probably wouldn't have had three or four of the wrecks that are on there, I would have put off to the side and said, we need to do more research. And some of them are quite modern, so we probably didn't actually have jurisdiction. Um, but hey, you know, if power unused is power abused. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that big chunk of concrete that you have to turn apart. How do you get that apart? You just break it apart? They slowly you break it apart. You get chisels. Okay. Um, usually, usually chemical won't work that well. Acids will eat what else you want because what you're also <coughs> looking for is if it's if the iron if it's iron and the iron is totally gone, you can infuse that void with uh, latex and get the shape. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, on the Coffin's Beach wreck, we have a chunk of concretion that has an impression. It's in water in my basement in a bucket because we have no place in the office until uh, next March, then it'll be going to the office. That has structure, you can see, and we probably want to do a late text impression to see if we can get the grain, because we can see that we were on top of the keel. There's a buttonhole in it, about uh, two inches by about not quite an inch deep. So probably the top of a pin, a uh, chaining pin that was used to hold the keel and the floors together. Uh, and that's about the only place you're going to find iron on, on those vessels. They, I mean, even in Essex, they were building almost completely wood ships into the 1930s. You know, you, you don't use iron, iron is used sparingly. Wood lasts longer and it requires less maintenance. Um, on Google Maps, there's a um, US address that you can answer. Yes, something. that's right up here. Yeah, what is that? The USS New Hampshire was you actually- You have to come to the museum. Yeah, mm -hmm. and oh, we have actually, uh, one of my, my former uh, classmates, is, <laughs> we won't talk about how many years ago that was. <laughs> Uh, has brought some artifacts from the New Hampshire with him. Um, it's typically what the New Hampshire was after the War of 1812. The, the U.S. government took a change and they were going to have this massive shipbuilding program and they were going to build, I think, 10 ships of the line. A ship of the line is a 100-gun vessel. And Portsmouth Navy Island was a place where several were going to be built. Well, we had a down, an economic downturn in 1818, 1819. Building stock. The New Hampshire, which actually um, was going to be the USS Alabama, sat in the waves. So the structure just sat in the yard, half built, almost completed, till the Civil War came along, and they needed vessels fast. Just like every war, we need vessels fast. We take anything we can get. They outfitted that vessel, but they knew that it was beyond, they don't use ships of the line anymore. And, but it saw duty as, in the blockade, as a headquarters vessel and the quartermaster vessel for, I think, the Southeastern Atlantic Fleet. I can't remember which fleet it was for, but it was that vessel. It saw our action as a ship on, on, at sea, brought back to Boston, um, brought back to New York after that, used as a training vessel. It was transferred, they wanted to build, if we were building iron battleships, they need, and battleships are named after states, they needed the name, they, well, Civil War came, they named it New Hampshire because they couldn't name it Alabama. <laughs> 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 you know, just like the Merrimack is yeah. really renamed the Virginia. You know, you know, but it went to the Naval Militia. So we think of Naval Reserves. We had Naval Militia.
militia as well. It had near Mass and New York and so on. The New Hampshire had to be changed. The name had to be dropped. Had to be given another name. So Grand Estate, New Hampshire Grand Estate. But that didn't have to be used for that wasn't reserved for battleships, so you could use New Hampshire. So a service with the naval militia in New York up until the twenties actually it is, has a relationship to another shipwreck in Massachusetts called the Yankee. The sailors on the Yankee were mustered into naval service on the USS New Hampshire when it was when it was in New York Harbor um, where it was stationed. But in any event, it caught fire. Not once, but twice it docked, and that was it. That, that was sending up the Maine for scrap. They sold it for scrap, so it goes out of naval service on its tow up to Maine to be dismantled. It catches fire and I guess is pulled, I don't know if it was blown in, but it ended up parting its lines and then just lost off of Graves Island. And that was it. How big is this issue? Um, couldn't tell you the dimensions, um, but the Constitution is small in comparison to the New Hampshire. The Hampshire actually saw a long service in Boston at the Navy Yard as a, a quartermaster vessel, a storage vessel, a floating dormitory. But it was a training vessel at, at its end. And but was it an exempt area? It's exempt, no, the vessel's exempt because it's so broken up, it just is falling apart. It's been so heavily vandalized. And I use that term not in a pejorative way, yes. just being removal of material that are exploited, that we felt they had no it was felt in 1985 when they did the designation that it was exempt. Unfortunately, it's also on the National Register of Historic Places, <laughs> which complicates matters. That doesn't stop collecting, by the way. The National Register, I, I won't even go into the fact that it's a toothless lion. Um, it's, it has a designation to recognize its value. We looked at it from an archaeological point of view, and this is before I came to the board, and they determined that the Everyone, every sport diver in the Northeast went to the New Hampshire from the 60s. The, it wasn't, it was pointless for us to give it protection. We have another ship called the White Squall, which has got a lot of damage to it, but the White Squall was an iron, one of the early iron ships from 1864 and wrecked in 1867. It had very little damage in terms of vandalism or exploitation. And we made that an underwater preserve, which means no one can collect there. It can only be scientifically studied. And it probably um, is one of the first vessels, uh, th this huge international pin trade, one of the first iron vessels. And one of the last vessels built in was Patterson. Yeah, Patterson was a, this, he was a builder in the transition from craft style, where you go out and you build a half wall and you build a ship to iron vessels where you set up that have real plans and naval architecture developing. A naval architecture before it's all theory and people like you today. You know, I saw Harold Bernal making a half you know, half hole the other day. <laughs> it's like it still can be done, but this iron vessels needed it and steel needed it.